doing in our midst today. God is so good. I want you to turn with me in your Bible. We're going to be kind of hovering this morning, surprise, surprise, around Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. So I want to ask if you will to turn with me there. And uh, while, we're, while you're turning there, let me just make mention to you, if you would, to keep um, a lady named Patricia Weeks in your prayer. Uh, she's not related to me, but uh, she is the wife of our drummer, Wayne Weeks. And they were in Alabama visiting his dad and celebrating their 41st anniversary. And uh, yesterday she was experiencing a lot of pain when she got up. They went to the emergency room. Long story short, severe gallbladder infections, and they took out her gallbladder yesterday. So um, just keep her in your prayers. Her name is Pat Weeks. She, is re she came through it fine and recovering, but we just want to ask God to continue to heal her today. I want to talk to you this morning for a few moments about Pentecost. We here at Crossroads Community Church of God, we, the Church of God as a denomination, are what's called a Pentecostal denomination. But I want you to know that Pentecost is not a denomination. It is something that God does in the hearts and lives of his people. In Acts chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, the word of God says this. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Let's stop right there. What in the world is Pentecost. We hear the word Pentecost tossed around and used in the Christian world many, many times. But the word Pentecost designates the 50th day after Passover, which was a feast, which is a feast. And it's known as the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Harvest. And so it's a special day in the nation of Israel. It was on this day in the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit was poured out on 120 followers of Jesus Christ who had gathered in an upper room on that day. It was on this day, this day of Pentecost, that the church, the New Testament church, was born in a blaze of glory, so to speak. It was born in a blaze of glory, and, and out of that came powerful men and women who turned the world upside down for the cause of Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. I believe that in today's church, talking about the church at large, in today's church, I believe that the average Christian is much like the Ephesian believers when the Apostle Paul came to them and he said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you first believed? And do you remember what their response was to him? We didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. We don't even know what this Holy Spirit is. Who is this Holy Spirit? Many Christians do not understand the role of the Holy Spirit. And as such, they have not appropriated the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit into their lives. What we need today in our churches across this world is to once again experience the power and the wind and the fire of Pentecost. We need to experience the move of the Holy Spirit in our churches where He comes in and has His way and He does what He wants and He makes known who He is. You see, too many times, some of you may not know this, but here at Crossroads, we put together an agenda of our service. So everybody kind of knows when they go and what's happening and what's going on. But can I tell you that when the Holy Spirit moves into the house, this becomes absolutely irrelevant. And we lay this down before him and we say, Holy Spirit, these are our plans, but we want you to have your way in our midst. 
And I think that's where we've missed it so many times in the body of Christ is so many churches have become so structured that we've structured out the move of the Holy Spirit. We've scheduled out the power of God in our churches. Pentecost, like I said, is not a denomination, but it's an experience that every blood-bought believer can have in their lives, can experience in their lives. We are privileged, I believe, to be living in a generation. And, and let me tell you, for all of the, the cons of living in this day and age, the wickedness that prevails and the, the, all of the deceit and manipulation and all, everything that's happening in our world, all of the evil, all the sin, all the wickedness, I believe that we are privileged, church, to live in a generation when God is again pouring out his spirit in unprecedented ways. God is showing up in the hearts and lives of people and he's beginning to pour himself out again. I believe that the reign of the Holy Spirit is falling on the dry religious ground of our day to bring a sweet refreshing. In a time when so many churches have compromised who they are for the sake of fitting in, to societal norms. In a time when so many Christians have justified their actions that are sinful simply so that they feel good about themselves. In a day and an age where so many pastors and evangelists and preachers and teachers are teaching a watered down, diluted gospel that appeases to self, we need a move of the Holy Spirit that eradicates all of that and begins to flow in again like he did in the upper room upon a remnant of people who are surrendered to him. Church, it's time. It's time. If we're going to see that outpouring that, that Joel prophesied, it's time that the body of Christ get the same spirit upon them that was upon those 120 that went into that upper room on that day and prayed and were in one accord and sought God. You see, I believe the promise of Pentecost is seen in Peter's sermon. In Acts chapter 2, after they were in the upper room and the Holy Spirit came in and all of that, we're going to get to that in a minute. But I want to fast forward beyond that for just a moment. In Acts chapter 2, Peter, this man who had been cowardly and afraid and had denied knowing Christ and had run scared after he had been in the upper room and after he had experienced the power of God, upon his life he came out of that room and he didn't care what anybody thought about him he didn't care if the rumor around town that he came out of that room drunk he didn't care what everybody was saying about him he wanted everybody to know at this point he knows jesus and not only does he know jesus he's experienced jesus in the power of his resurrection and in the power of his holy spirit and he begins to preach this sermon and he says repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he said, this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off and for all whom the Lord our God will call. In effect, he was saying that this outpouring of the Holy Spirit is not a special blessing for a select few. I know that many people say, oh, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, baptism in the Holy Spirit, and the church of God, we believe in speaking in tongues. We believe in that being part of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. But I want, and many people say, well, that was for them back in the New Testament. That was for them in that one occasion on that day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came in and manifested himself in that way. But this pastor believes... That that wasn't just for them. Amen. That the empowering of the Holy Spirit has come down through the generations and he has swept in like a sound of a mighty rushing wind through generations. He's caused men and women through history to rise up in difficult times, in trying times, in persecuting times. Men and women who would give their life for the cause of the gospel. The Holy Spirit has come in and caused them to rise up in power and anointing. And I believe that this same Holy Spirit is rising up in the church 
church today for those who are hungry for him and for those who want him. I believe this same outpouring is happening in the world today, and it's necessary. You see, many, many people have allowed the, the enemy and even religious tradition to rob us of the power of God. We get so steeped in just fighting the enemy, and we, we think we have to do it on our own, and we become powerless on our own, and we miss the power of God in our lives. The promise of the Holy Spirit is for all who have been called to repentance. For all who are bought with the blood of Jesus. And since God is still calling men to salvation and women to salvation and teenagers and children to salvation, I believe that this promise is still good today. I believe the power of Pentecost is still operational today. What is the power of Pentecost? What Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. And what was the promise of Pentecost? It was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon all flesh, both men and women. In Luke 24, verse 49, Luke writes, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem, until you are endued with power from on high. From on high. Jesus had been talking about the power of the Holy Spirit all of his ministry. He had been talking about the power of God all of his ministry. And he told them to tarry in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So what are the ingredients of the church today experiencing that same kind of outpouring that they experienced on the day of Pentecost? Because if we believe he still works and he still moves in that way of pouring his spirit out on the church, why aren't we seeing it happen in the church today? Why isn't it being manifested? I mean, we see little, little snippets of it here and there. But I believe when the power of the Holy Spirit comes in, it revolutionizes a church. Amen. The whole face of the church changes. And it isn't just the pastor or the deacons or the musicians or singers who are operating under the power of the Holy Spirit. But every single one of us begin to operate under the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I want to tell you a little story about a man named Jet. No, not about a man named Jet. <laughs> I saw this played out on Wednesday night. And I got to be honest, my spirit just wept in me. And I, I won't tell you the whole story. I'll just kind of fast forward to the end of it. We had a young man come into service Wednesday night, and he came straight down here to the second row. And I didn't know him, didn't know who he was. And, and immediately, I'm like, okay, wait, who is this? And I thought to myself, I'm not concealed carrying today. <laughs> it's what I thought. I mean... I'm human, just like y'all are. And so I started scanning the room to see who might be caring. <laughs> but I just took a moment, and someone else was speaking, and we were listening to them speak, and, and I thought to my, I just prayed. I said, Holy Spirit, we're in your hands. You just protect us. But I want to tell you what happened after service. I saw this power of the Holy Spirit and the ministry of the Holy Spirit take such a profound it, it was just amazing to me. And, and I stood here at the lectern where I was standing for a moment and just in my spirit just kind of wept. I saw one of the ladies of our church, and I'm not going to call her out, but I saw one of the ladies of our church immediately after I dismissed in prayer. She went straight over to this young man and began to talk to him. And the next thing I know, she's got his hands and she's praying over him. And she's seeking God for him. And I thought to myself, God, that's the power of the Holy Spirit working in the church. And I want more of that. That's the power of the Holy Spirit to witness. That's the power of the Holy Spirit to pray, an anointed prayer over someone. So what do we need to, as, as believers to get to that point, to get to that moment? I believe first 
We have to believe and trust the words of Jesus Christ. I believe it with all my heart. These 120, they knew the words of Jesus Christ when he said, I will send the promise of my Father, but you go tarry in Jerusalem until you have been endued with power from on high. They believed his words. They heard his promise and they believed his words. It wasn't that they questioned him or or they, they didn't understand or didn't believe. This is what he said. This was his command. And this is what we're going to do. So many times we find ourselves, we know the word of God. The word of God is in our heart. We can quote scriptures. But do we really believe what we're saying? Has it gotten into our heart so deeply that it has affected our belief system? Or is it simply just a knowledge? You say, well, how can you have knowledge of the word of God and not affect you? Well, probably one of the most skilled, one of the persons who knows the word of God the best is Lucifer. He knows the word of God. He knows how to take it and use it and twist it and manipulate it. But on the flip side of that, he also knows the end of the word of God that he loses in the end, right? He already knows that. And so he's fighting as hard as he can. But the word of God is so powerful and so anointed and so strong in our lives that it will literally affect the way we believe. It will affect us to the point of our whole belief system can be changed. I've heard testimonies. I've talked to people who said, I used to be an atheist, and then I met Jesus, and I got into the Word of God, and it changed my life. I listened to a man tell his story one time at a conference that I was at, and I bought his book because it was so powerful to me. He was raised a Muslim, and he, he was from uh, the, uh, where was he from? Um, he spoke here at our church. You heard his testimony too. Um, Afghanistan, Iraq, somewhere in that area. But he was raised as a Muslim, and he was taught the, the Torah through, or, throughout his whole life. And he, he said, I had to memorize those scriptures. And if I didn't memorize those scriptures, my father beat me until I memorized those scriptures. And if I questioned those scriptures, I got beaten. If I questioned the way of Muslims, I got beaten. He said, and I, the whole process is he went to college, da, 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 met a girl, and, and found Jesus. Jesus found him and changed his life completely changed his whole belief system when he found the word of God. And now he's preaching the gospel message of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, he's a bishop in the church of God in his country. And see, the word of God changes how we believe, but we have to believe it. These people heard Jesus say, I'm promising you this. You go to Jerusalem and you tarry there and you're going to receive the promise of God. You're going to receive the power of God. Now, there are people in our life that they can promise us the moon, and we know they're never going to deliver. We know it's never going to happen. But I want to tell you something. When Jesus promises you something, it's as good as done. It's as good as done. So they believed it with all their heart, and the Scripture says they committed themselves to it. They went to that upper room together, this 120, and they stayed there. They committed themselves to prayer and seeking the promise of the Holy Spirit. They were committed to it. They weren't half-hearted. They weren't, maybe I'll be there, maybe I won't. I want to I be there, but, you know, those fish aren't going to catch themselves. No, they were committed to the promise. We live in a day and an age where it's tough to get anybody to commit to anything. And that has found its way even into the church. And I'm not just talking about ministries. There are people who sit on church pews every week who are only half-heartedly committed to the relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't care what the outside says. They they can speak all of the Christianese that they know. But the truth of the matter is they're only half-heartedly committed because they haven't truly believed the words of Jesus Christ. 
And that belief hasn't changed their life. And you may say, Pastor, you're preaching hard. Yeah, I am, and I don't apologize for it. Amen. Because this is the Word of God. Amen. We have to be committed to this. Those 120 went into that upper room, and they shut that door, and they began to pray, and they began to seek. And I'm asking you, where is the church who will continue to pray until they've experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Because you know what? We can talk about wanting revival all day long. We can sing about revival all day long. But where is the church who's committed to getting on her face before God with the rest of the body of Christ and coming together and praying for that promise? We have to rise up into this. Our flesh will fight against it. Our flesh will keep, uh, try to keep us from it. But if it's important enough to us, it will become a reality because we will commit ourselves to the promise of God. There is nothing importanter than that. <laughs> nothing. Nothing, church. Hear me. I want to see the power of the Holy Spirit move in our church once again. Like it did on the day of Pentecost, like I've seen it do before. The power move through our church. Because when they believed the words of Jesus and they committed themselves to his purpose, they experienced the power. The scripture says 10 days after Jesus ascended into heaven, he sent the promise of the Father and the faithful ones who obeyed. And they, they were filled with the Holy Spirit of God. They were filled. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, somebody, is somebody in Acts chapter 2? If you're in Acts chapter 2, stand up and read for me until I say stop. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Okay, stop. Right there. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, it was the right time. It was the right moment. And they were gathered together and they were praying. And I don't know about you, but in my mind, I, I just imagine them on their knees before a bench or a chair praying and seeking God. And you know, there's moments in praying where you feel the intensity begin to build. And you understand that you're moving from just a now I lay me down to sleep prayer into a true intercessory prayer. You're getting deeper into prayer. And it doesn't matter if your cell phone rings, you're going to ignore it because you don't want to miss this moment. And I can just imagine these 120 men and women as they're gathered together and they're either kneeling or on their face or they're walking around praying and they begin to feel the intensity of the Holy Spirit build in them. And all of a sudden somebody says, hey, do you hear something? Do you hear something? Yeah, I hear other people. No, it's not other people that I'm talking about. It's not the voices of prayers that are going up. It's not the songs of praise that are going up. I hear something else that is moving in the atmosphere. Do you hear it? And this is my version of it, okay? And, and all of a sudden, he's like, you know what? I do hear that. I can hear it. And all of a sudden, whoosh, like the sound of a mighty rushing wind, the Holy Spirit, like a freight train, comes through the upper room and flames of fire fall from heaven on each of them and they began to speak in tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance you see it's all about the Holy Spirit and the power the promise that Jesus had made to them became theirs you see I believe in this work of the baptism of the Holy Spirit I believe I believe with all my heart that the church needs this baptism in the Holy Spirit I believe we must have the power of the Holy Ghost today. Listen, I, it's funny because we use those terms interchangeably, Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost. And, and I, I, just like a side story here, I was at, um, most of you know I have Moonlight for North Brevard Funeral Home, and I was at a funeral at um, the Path Church, which used to be the Pentecostals. Now it's called the Path Church. And their pastor there um, came 
came up to me. He, we knew, we've known each other, and uh, over the years, we're not like close friends, but you know, I, okay, truth time. I've seen him in Sonny's about three times. <laughs> <laughs> And so uh, uh, he came up to me and he read my name that badge. He's like, oh, yeah, you're J.C. Weeks. I said, yeah. He's like, you're the pastor of that Church of God over on Knox McCray. And there was a, another young man that was standing there. He's about 21, and he doesn't have a church background. And he was listening to us talk. And uh, Pastor Jody said, uh, uh, you're one of those Holy Ghost preachers, aren't you? And I said, I said, well, yeah, I guess you could say that. He's like, me too. And we did a high five. I'm like, I know you are. And uh, so afterwards, um, this, this other young man, uh, his name is Alex. It was a couple days later. He kind of had this just going over on, in his head. And he said, yeah, I want to ask you a couple questions. I said, I had no idea what he was going to ask me. And uh, he said, when we were in the church that church the other day, standing in the foyer, and that pastor came up and talked to you. He said, he referenced Holy Ghost a couple of times. What is that? Because he said, you're like a Holy Ghost preacher. And he's like, I have no idea what the Holy Ghost is. I said, well, have you heard of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? He said, yes, I've heard of that. I said, well, the Holy Spirit is just uh, the Holy Ghost. We use those terms interchangeably. He said, well, what, what did he mean that you're a Holy Ghost preacher? I said, I don't know. No. <laughs> I, said, uh, I said, well, in, in, in our church and in the Pentecostal churches, I said, to be known as a Holy Ghost preacher is somebody who preaches fiery and loud and, and, you know, just is very passionate about what they're preaching. And he's like, oh, oh, okay. He's like screaming and hollering. <laughs> I said, well, sometimes, you know, but not always, but sometimes. And uh, he's like, I, and I got, it was interesting because I got the opportunity to talk to him about not just Jesus, but the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. You never know when that opportunity might arise. And church, I, I want you to understand this. The Holy Spirit has not lost his power. I think the church has lost her focus. The Holy Spirit still has all the power he's ever had. But the church has become distracted. We've got to set our sights once again on the promise of the power of the Holy Spirit. Modern day church, for the most part, has lost the power of God. We've we become a place where we simply are happy to placate the masses just to get butts on a pew. And a lot of churches have become nothing more than a social club or a civic organization with a religious tent. That's not what I'm hungry for. I'd rather have a church of 50 people who are filled with the Holy Spirit in power and in might than a church of 500 who just come to see and be seen. Just like Samson in the Bible, so many churches don't know that the Spirit of God has departed from them. Samson did not know that the Spirit of God had left him. Many churches still have a form of religion or godliness, but they have no power. And like Samson, he laid his head in Delilah's lap and fell asleep not knowing that she had cut his hair. There really was no power in his hair. The power was in his obedience. But the word was he was not to cut his hair. And because of his disobedience, he woke up and did not realize that he had lost the power of God and could do nothing but be blind and bound and grinding at the mill of the enemy. And I fear for the body of Christ in our world today that we have laid our heads in the lap of the world. 
and have fallen asleep thinking everything's okay, only to realize in the end that we've lost the power of God, that we are blind, that we are bound, and we're simply grinding at the mill of the enemy. God, help us. God, help us. But I believe that it is truly a new day of restoration. God is restoring the power of the Holy Spirit to the church that desires it, that is hungry for it, that wants it. And as your pastor, I make you this promise. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop preaching the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to stop preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't care if it offends you. I don't care if it hurts your feelings. I don't care if it steps on your toes. Heck, half of the time what I preach steps on my own toes. Because I'm hungry for more than just the status quo another church service. I want the power of God. I want the power of God. Some of you have been going through some really difficult times in your life. You feel like you're walking through hell. I want you to remember that Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave. So even if you're going through hell, you walk through it like you own the place. Because you have the power of God in your life. You have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. I want to ask you to stand with me. I'm not done preaching, but I'm done preaching because the Holy Spirit said I'm done. If you would close your eyes with me for just a moment. Oh, Holy Spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit. We are hungry for you. Call out to him, church. Holy Spirit, we're hungry for you. Some of us are carrying around burdens and brokenness. And we will only overcome them by the power of your Holy Spirit. I want to ask you, everybody that possibly can, to come to this altar. If you want to kneel, if you want to stand, if you want to sit on the front row, I don't care. But I want to ask you to come to this altar right now as we begin to seek the face of God on this Pentecost Sunday of 2021. I want you to know that the power of God is still as, as potent as it was on the day that he came in Acts. Oh, Holy Spirit. When you get here, I want you to lift your hands. I know there's not 120 of us here, but I'm telling you, if you believe the word of Jesus this morning and you commit yourself to pray, he's going to answer. He's going to show up. He's going to meet your need. He is here, church. He's here. something in your life today.